Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, so he said it all, so let's get into it. But I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about me. This might be a little redundant if you saw the panel yesterday. Uh, but I've been a software engineer at MongoDB for a little over two years now. Um, I work on the drivers team, so we build the client libraries um, that let you use MongoDB from a ton of different programming languages. I don't remember exactly the number, which is why I just said many, but it's somewhere in the ballpark of 12. Um, and I work on our uh, official driver for Swift, which I used to say was the newest driver, but now that we started working on our Rust driver, it's our second newest. <laughs> Um, and I just submitted a pitch to the Swift Server Working Group for the driver um, a couple days ago. So if you are interested in hearing about that or you have any thoughts or feedback on it, um, please go chime in on the forums thread there at tinyurl.com slash mongodb dash pitch. Um, so something pretty cool about my job is that I get to spend all my time around people who basically spend their days maintaining open source libraries. Um, and I've gotten to, I don't know, learn a lot of cool things from them um, that I think are valuable to anyone who's interested in uh, libraries. And today I'm going to talk about that. Um, so let's start off by just sort of defining what I mean by maintaining a library. Um, maintaining includes adding features, removing features, uh, modifying your APIs, so maybe not adding or removing, but changing, um, fixing bugs, addressing security vulnerabilities. It can also include just like refactoring and internal changes, even if they aren't like directly user facing, um, and then adapting to changes in the language and ecosystem. So maybe a new version of Swift comes out and it um, makes something in your library obsolete, or your library um, integrates with Vapor and a new Vapor release comes out and you need to change to adapt to that, that sort of thing. Um, so all these things sort of what they have in common is that they involve change. Like change is just sort of an inevitable part of maintaining a library. I think it's kind of part of the definition. Um, if you just wrote it and then never changed it, you wouldn't actually be maintaining it. And what I want to talk about today is how we can um, deal with making these sort of changes in libraries without it being too painful of an experience for our users. Um, we're going to have to do these things, but we don't want to alienate our users and make it unpleasant for them every time we change something. So I think maybe the most important thing that I want to start off with is change your API gradually. Um, and so for a little example of this, um, if you've seen any of my talks before, you follow me on Twitter or anything, you know that I love cats. Um, and conference talks are just kind of an excuse to show people pictures of my cats. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm going to come back to a classic cat example, similar to what I've used before. So say you maintain some library that has a public type in it, cat. Um, and when you initialize this cat, you provide a cat name in the form of a string. And this cat has a method that allows you to feed it. Um, and it feeds the cat one can of food. So if we wanted to use this API, we could use it with both of my cats. I have to use both, to be fair. Um, <laughs> So we can create one for my cat, Chester, uh, and then we call feed. We feed him, he's happy. Um, same for Roscoe. Um, and we feed him, and he's happy. And that's great. And um, you know, when you feed your cats, they're very happy for a few hours. But inevitably, my cats always sort of get to the point where they forget that they've been fed, even if it wasn't that long ago and they start demanding more food from me. <laughs> so I don't know if this is sort of the best solution for uh, dealing with hungry cats, but what I've found works a little bit better is splitting up their food throughout the day rather than giving them just like one meal at one time. So I don't give them like a whole can at once. Um, otherwise, when I get home from work, you know, they're gonna ask for more. So my API doesn't really allow me to do that right now. I can only give them a whole can at once. So what if I wanted to start allowing people to give cats snacks in my API? So probably a logical way to do that would be to change this feed method, right? So that you can actually specify how many cans you're going to feed your cat. So if I wanted to just give my cat a little snack, you know, I could just pass in 0.25 cans of food. Um, so this is great, and now users can sort of decide how much they want to feed their cat at a time. But this is a breaking change. Um, so if a user had already started using my library, um, whatever last version I've released, and they were doing, you know, this sort of thing, creating a cat and feeding it, that's not going to compile anymore. Um, when the user tries to call that method, they're going to get this error about how they're missing the parameter cans. Um, so that's kind of not great. At least in this case, the, uh, the compiler error is like somewhat helpful. Um, and so the user can probably figure out what they need to change. Um, but it's still not great. So could we make this change a little more gradually? Um, so sort of the first uh, 
or one helpful way that you can make gradual changes in your library is using default values when you introduce new parameters to methods, if it's possible. So in this case, um, we could introduce a default value for the cans parameter of one, rather than just always requiring the user to specify it. Um, and so this is nice because it allows us to preserve the existing behavior. If you remember before, what this method was doing um, was giving the cat one can of food. Um, and now, afterward, we're still giving the cat one can of food. So anyone who is relying on this method to do that isn't going to experience any change in behavior um, with your library. Um, at the same time, um, the user's old code is still going to compile, so they're not going to need to fix anything. Um, but users who do want to take advantage of this new feature uh, are going to be able to start using it now. Um, so that's pretty nice because we're sort of satisfying the request from users to do the old or the new thing, but we can still satisfy our users who are doing it the old way um, and not cause them too much of a problem when they upgrade to the next version of our library. Okay, so that's sort of one type of change we might make. But then a user might come along and be like, hey, you know, not all cans of cat food are the same size, um, which I never really thought about until I got cats and I started looking at all the different sizes of food. Um, and now I buy the largest ones because it's the most <laughs> economical. Um, but maybe this wasn't really a great design for the API to begin with because we made a really big assumption about how big a can of cat food was. So maybe what this API should really look like is this, where we actually take in like a number of ounces of food you're going to feed your cat. Um, and you know, learning our lesson from last time, we could say, well, we were assuming all cans of cat food were six ounces, so we're going to provide a default value of six um, for the number of ounces we're feeding the cat. Um, and then users are going to be able to do this sort of thing where they pass in a number of ounces to the feed method. But this is actually still a breaking change. So um, since we've changed the label that uh, goes into the method, um, users who were using uh, cans before are no longer going to be able to use cans. Um, so we haven't broken things for users who never started using the cans way, but um, we have broken things for... Er, other way around. <laughs> we have broken things for users who started doing, thing the cans doing things the cans way, and for users who never sort of changed uh, to specifying the parameter, they're still okay. Um, so sort of the more gradual way to change this would be to deprecate the old method first. Um, so if you're going to remove something eventually, um, it's really nice if you can first deprecate it to sort of give the user a chance to figure out how to adopt the new API. So you can do this in Swift by adding this sort of at available attribute um, above the method. Um, and that, oh, this specifically says on all platforms um, in versions of Swift, this method is deprecated. And uh, when a user tries to use it, the compiler is going to give them this message to use this new one instead. Um, and so then users are going to say see that when they compile their code and know that there's this new method they should switch to using. Um, so they do this, and the compiler says this. And so it's a really helpful message, targeted. It'll include the line number of wherever the user was doing this. Uh, so that's pretty nice. Uh, and so this attribute is actually um, pretty powerful because like, you can also mark things as unavailable. So that's nice if you decide to remove something, but you want to be able to give users a message about like that uh, type name or something. Um, so you can uh, even indicate that what it's been renamed to or that sort of thing. You could also say, like, deprecate something as of a particular version of Swift. Maybe you were doing something in your library and then Swift 4.2 basically added support for whatever you were doing. Um, you could also do this based on platform. Um, so you could say this is available on Mac OS as of 10.14 or something like that. So the documentation on this is pretty good, so I recommend going to that if you want some more details on it. But sort of the short of available and what's pretty cool about it is it lets you use the compiler to communicate things to your users. Um, you can you know, write as much documentation as you want, but at the end of the day, people are probably going to pay more attention to the compiler. <laughs> so um, that's pretty nice. OK, so now we talked about how you deprecate something that you plan to remove. But when do you actually remove that thing? Um, to answer that question, I think we need to talk a little bit about semantic versioning. Um, which you might have been exposed to, or you probably have been exposed to at some point, um, but I think it's sort of worth going through the details here because it gives us a nice framework for thinking about sort of what are the different kinds of changes we can make. So semantic versioning is a versioning scheme where the differences between version numbers convey information about what has changed between the corresponding releases. Uh, so that's where the semantic part comes in. So a version semantic versioning is in this format, x.y.z where X is what's called the major version, Y is what's called the minor version, and Z is the patch version. 
So if you started off where your last release was 1.0.0, you tagged a major version release, you'd go to 2.0.0. If you tagged a minor release, you'd go to 1.1.0. And a patch release, you'd go to 1.0.1. Um, and these sort of releases each have kind of different types of changes you're allowed to make in them. Um, so let's sort of talk about what those types of changes are. So the first of those is something that's like a backwards compatible bug fix. So you know you have some method that's supposed to return true under some circumstances, but it accidentally returns false. Um, it's not going to break any user's code to fix this. In fact, if anyone's relying on it, it's going to fix the problems they were having due to the bug. Um, and you can put that in any type of release. Uh, the next type of change is new functionality that's backwards compatible. So that would be like adding a new method or a new type to your API. It's not going to break anyone's existing code, um, but it's a new feature they can use. And so those are allowed to go into major and minor releases, but not patch releases. The next change is deprecating functionality. So that's what we were just talking about, adding that deprecated attribute. Um, so you can do that in a major release or a minor release. Um, substantial internal changes, so kind of that like refactoring type of stuff we were talking about before, um, can also go into major and minor releases. And then the last thing is backwards incompatible changes, and those should only ever go into a major version release. Um, so that's sort of the classification of different types of changes you might make. It doesn't encompass everything, but um, I think that's sort of the gist of it. So why would you use this versioning system? Um, I think it's really useful because it's sort of a contract between maintainers and users about what they can actually expect to change when they upgrade to a new version of your library. Um, so they know, okay, I'm pulling in a patch release, it's not gonna break anything, nothing's gonna be deprecated. Or I'm doing a minor version release, there might be things deprecated, but nothing will break. And then they know when they're ready to deal with things maybe breaking, then they'll pull in a major version release. Something to note about semantic versioning is that there's sort of no rules um, before you get to a 1.0 release. So the major version 0, zero where the x is 0 is for initial development, um, and then once you get to a stable API is when you tag 1.0. That said, sometimes you end up in sort of a pre-1.0 state for a while, um, like which is what I've been in with a MongoDB driver. Um, and it might be nice for users to have some kind of sense of like, when you're going to do certain kinds of changes or not. So sort of an informal system we've decided on is that um, anytime we're going to make a breaking change, we at least bump the minor version. So I think that's sort of nice because users at least know like they could pull in a patch and it won't break things. So this comes into play when users include your library in Swift Package Manager. So when you include a package, you give a URL um, and you also give a requirement. And that, there's sort of three different flavors of that that come into play with versions. So the first one is an exact requirement, um, which uh, you just give a version number, and the only version of a library that will satisfy that particular requirement is exactly 1.0.0. Um, so that would be useful if you're depending on like a brand new library that hasn't done a 1.0 yet, and you want to pin to a particular patch version, because you can't guarantee that your code will even compile with their next patch. Um, the next way you can include something is up to the next minor version. So if you did that, then anything from 1.0.0 and then up to but not including 1.1.0 would satisfy that. So that basically means you can pull in patch releases without having to like update your package.swift or the way you're including this dependency. Um, and then there's up to the next major version, um, which will automatically pull in any changes um, up to but not including the next major release. Um, so that would possibly like automatically bring in things that have warnings and bring in new features, but it won't break anything. OK, so coming back to our question about when you can remove a deprecated feature. So the first thing you should do um, is deprecate it in a minor version release. Um, and then the next thing you should do is remove it no sooner than your next major version release. In some cases, you know, maybe you deprecated it really quickly before you did a major version release, and you want to give users another major version to work around it or something. Maybe you would wait one more. Um, and so I sort of have an asterisk here because you could skip, skip step one. Like, that's not against the rules of semantic versioning. You can just bring in breaking changes. Um, but if it's like a method that a lot of people are using throughout your library or like a really common type or that sort of thing, um, you might consider doing what I was talking about before and first like marking that declaration unavailable and then removing it later on because that gives users a little bit more of a chance to get help from the compiler um, upgrading the changes. Um, before it's just like their code completely breaks and they can't figure out why. Okay, so that's sort of adding and removing features. Um, 
And now I want to talk about just sort of deciding what goes into your API to begin with. Um, so in general, I think it's good to add to your API conservatively. So one sort of thing to think about is um, if there's already a way to do something pretty simply, don't add another way to do it. So, you know, I have multiple cats, so maybe I would say I want to be able to feed all my cats at the same time because I always give them dinner together anyway, right? Um, so maybe I would say I should add like a feed cats method that takes an array of cats and feeds the cats. But it was already pretty easy for me to do this without that method. Like the implementation of this would just look something like that, right? I would loop over all the cats and feed them. So I, I don't think it's really worth adding a feed cats method just to do that when the user could already do it in one line. It's kind of confusing for a user because it's not clear which method they should use. Like if you, if you added a feed cats method, is that doing anything different than just looping over? Um, and it also adds greater, greater maintenance overhead for you in the long run. Like right now, this seems really great, but then you know, we made those changes to change the parameters to feed. And then you'd maybe have to update feed cats to take in that parameter. And then you'd have to decide what, you know, is the user going to pass in the amount they feed to all the cats and divide it? Like, it, it, the method would become more complex as feed became more complex, um, and so it's just going to make things more difficult for you over time. That said, you should add helpers to kind of eliminate common user, error, user errors and uh, boilerplate on commonly used code paths. Sort of the reason we write libraries is to help users do things and not have to write code again and again, right? Um, so it is important to do these sometimes. So like for example, MongoDB drivers, their sort of purpose is to send commands to the server and receive responses and give those to the user. Um, and you could basically uh, implement a whole MongoDB driver by just letting people send a command document and then look at the command back. Um, but that's not so great. Like for example, the MongoDB insert command, you could do an insert like this. If you wanted to say insert a couple documents to a collection, um, and you want to use a write concern. So write concern is relevant when you're using like a MongoDB deployment with multiple servers, and this says how many servers you'd like your write to propagate to before it's considered um, like successful. Um, so this is the majority of the servers. So you, you could just do all your inserts like this, and that would work, and then you would inspect the return value of this method um, and make sure it worked. Um, but users do a lot of inserts. So in this case, it's pretty valuable if we can actually provide like a nice type safe way for them to do that in the form of an insert many method. So in this case, you know, we help the user construct the right concern. They don't have to do a document. They can do it uh, through this right concern type. Um, and they have an option struct to specify all their options. And then they have this nice sort of uh, much more safe way of accessing a collection and sending the correct command. And there's no, not as much room to like make typos or anything like that. Um, so in cases like these, it is really important to add helpers. That said, like, we don't add helpers for everything you can do with a MongoDB database. And it's sort of like, uh, you know, we have to think through what users are doing a lot and what they're not. Like one example of this is there's all these methods for um, user and role management in databases. Like you can create users and give them permissions to do certain things. Um, and some drivers had added helpers to, um, work with those commands to let you like create users and change their permissions and that sort of thing. Um, but every time the MongoDB server, say, adds a new role that a user can have or changes how that command is structured, that incurs overhead for us because then we have to update our corresponding helper method. Um, and uh, users also don't actually perform that task very much in the driver. Like creating users and that sort of thing is something you sort of set up initially on a database and then you don't think about it again. It's not usually handled at the application level. So while it might have been useful for us for testing, um, it's not something that's really worth including in the public API. Um, so sort of to summarize the philosophy around that, um, I'd like to use a quote from one of my coworkers, Jesse Davis. Features are like children, conceived in a moment of passion. They must be supported for years to come. <laughs> um, so it's important to think carefully about whether you want to add these things in the first place. You might be really jazzed up and like, oh, I'm sick of having to you know, feed all my cats separately. Um, but then you're going to have to you know, keep uh, updating that method as time goes on. So Jesse gave a talk that was sort of similar to this one that kind of inspired me giving this talk that's kind of the Python version of this. Um, at a couple Python conferences, and he also wrote a blog post. Um, so I definitely recommend checking out his talk to get sort of his take on all of this um, and see where sort of I'm coming from here. So on that note, um, I would say when in doubt, you should leave something out. Um, by default, 
you should use make things internal, file private, private, whatever the most restrictive you can make it is. Um, Swift libraries by default, everything is internal, so um, you do kind of have to go out of your way to make it public. But if you just think, oh, well, I don't see why this couldn't be public, that's not really a compelling reason to make it so. Like the things you expose might end up being implementation details that need to be changed later on. Um, and then you're kind of stuck because maybe you were exposing some like randomly generated ID or something, but you want to change the type of the ID you're using. Then it turns out maybe some user was actually relying on access to that ID or something like that. Um, and now you're kind of in a bind because um, you can't actually change this until your next major version release. So it's always easier to add something later than it is to remove it later. We've seen that removing features is kind of this multi-step process of deprecating and then removing. Um, but adding, you can just add it and tag a minor version release. Um, so on my team, whenever we're not really sure if we should add something, sort of the resolution often ends up being, well, we can always add it later. Um, okay. So that's sort of features, um, but now I want to talk about sort of just like what you support in general. Um, and that's like in terms of Swift version, but also operating system. In our case, it's relevant like what MongoDB server versions we support. Uh, for you, it might be like what Vapor versions your library works with or anything like that. Um, but what's really important is that if you say you support something, you need to t actually test it. So if you say you support like these two operating systems and these two versions of Swift, you should be running your tests on all of them. Um, you can't actually say you support it unless if you're pretty comp like you have this confidence of your test passing there. Um, that said, how should you decide what to support? Um, so it's not sort of like hard and fast rules, but I think like the Swift Server Workgroup graduation requirements are a pretty good starting point for thinking about. Uh, what you might want to support in a library. Um, so you should have CI set up for the two latest recommended versions of Swift. Um, you should have CI set up for the two latest versions of the recommended Linux distributions. You should test on Mac OS and Linux. Um, and you should support new versions of Swift within 30 days of their GA release. Um, one lesson I sort of learned there is that it's helpful if you test your code early. So there are these development snapshots of Swift that come out. Um, I kind of got bit by some big changes in Swift 5 that I wasn't prepared for. Um, and I think that compared to maybe other languages I'd worked on before, people in Swift are very eager to, you know, jump to the next version of the language. Um, and so it was kind of a scramble to adapt to the changes in Swift 5 once they were released because people were within a few days asking for, um, you know, the code to work in those cases. So test things early. That said, you might decide to support more or less. It's kind of depending on maybe how much bandwidth you have to keep maintaining this library, um, and also the needs of you and your users. So maybe you have some other thing that's depending on this library, and you, it's going to be a big effort to, say, upgrade it to a new version of Swift. You might say, I'm going um, you know, to keep supporting that old version of Swift on my library because that's easier, and that sort of thing. Um, or maybe you have customers who are using your library, and they can upgrade, or that sort of thing. Okay. So those are sort of like more technical components, but I think it's really important that you help users using your words too. So one big way you can do that is by publishing release notes. Um, so every time you do a release, you should do this. And this should basically just describe what's changed and what's new in a release. Uh, and when it's appropriate, you can provide context on why you changed something. Um, sometimes a user you know, maybe really liked a feature and now you're going to remove it, and it's helpful for them to know what, what was the logic behind that. Um, and maybe is there some new method they're supposed to be using, or that sort of thing. So you should highlight anything they should know, whether that's things that are going away, things that have changed, whether you added or dropped support for something, that sort of thing. And it's also helpful if you include links to sort of uh, GitHub issues or pull requests or JIRA tickets or that sort of thing for all the changes that were included, because maybe sometimes someone like starts experiencing some weird failure and they can't figure out why, if they can actually see a list of all the changes you made, um, it's going to make it a lot easier for them to track that down. And also, I actually use my release notes myself now <laughs> when I can't really remember what went in. I can go look in Jira, but I think the GitHub version looks a little nicer. <laughs> um, when you make a really big change, it's also helpful if you can write a migration guide. Um, so you can explain the rationale behind everything you've changed there, and you can sort of include examples of how to accomplish common tasks, both the old way of doing them and the new way of doing them. Um, and so, like, we are doing this right now for this new BSON API I talked about, um, since it's going to require users making some manual changes to their code. 
Um, if it's possible to automate any of the process, maybe by like using a script or that sort of thing, it's also really helpful to users if you include instructions for that, um, because that will kind of make the process a little less painful for them. Uh, finally, it's really important that you keep your documentation and examples up to date over time. It's nothing, it's like really frustrating as a user when you say, go to use some new library and you find like an example in the readme or something like that, um, or like in an examples directory and it doesn't actually compile with the latest version of the library. Um, so if possible, I recommend trying to check as part of your release process that any of your sample projects still compile um, with the release that you're about to tag. Um, and that's sort of a really good way to just make sure you keep things in sync, and anytime you put something out, users have sort of this body of code that they know will work with the new release. Okay, so in summary, um, add to your API conservatively. It's always easier to add things later than it is to take them away. Um, so think critically about the things you add and listen to your users' feedback about uh, how much they'll use certain features. Um, also introduce changes gradually. Um, we've talked about deprecation warnings, we talked about marking things you've removed unavailable, that sort of thing, that can all help them. And then you can use a combination of semantic versioning and swift features um, and good documentation to sort of help users along through the process of using your library over time. All right, thanks so much. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.